God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Yeah, right? The phrase, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It has a meaning behind it. It's more prevalent back in the 80s and the 90s. I still hear it every once in a while. But what it kind of means is, you know, I've already seen that. I've already done that. I don't need to do it again. It wasn't that great the first time, really, is the idea. It was either boring or what didn't turn out or I just didn't like it. So, been there, done that. Not going to do it again. And we have different scenarios where that could happen in our own lives. And even as I was pondering it this week, you know, I just started coming with a list of things where I could simply say, yeah, been there, done that, don't need to do it again. For example, you know, Teresa and I have been on road trips various places in the Northwest, and one of my least favorite things to do, actually, is drive through the Columbia River Gorge in a heavy rainstorm. It's just no fun. I'd rather be in a snowstorm than in the, in the Columbia River Gorge in a hard rainstorm. And, and so we've done this, and I can remember, we were in this traffic thing one time, and just the rain and everything, we finally got through it, I was like, oh. I was just worn out. Been there, done that. Don't need to do that again. Or, for example, maybe with, you know, I used to lead youth group for years, youth pastor and youth minister in various settings. And for years, we would do these lock ins where all the kids and some leaders gather together in the church and you lock everybody in for the night. You stay up all night and do silly things and eat a lot of sugar. And, and, and been there, done that. I don't need to do that again. I'm a little beyond lock ins by now. So, but so, you know, I even have a few t-shirts from those things, but, it, but been there, done that, don't need to do it again. Or another example that came to my mind was when I was working for the University of Nevada and I'd spend time in all kinds of different small towns throughout Nevada. Most of the towns in Nevada are quite small. And, and so I'd stay in hotels and various things and, and I stayed in Lovelock, Nevada. It's right along the I-80 corridor. I stayed in this hotel there once and when I got up in the morning, I'd been there, done that. Never stay in here again. And, and I would avoid Lovelock like the plague. But, uh, you know, so we have these things in our lives where we would, might say, been there, done that, don't need to do that again. And I'm thinking that Jesus could have said the same thing. He saw what happened in the garden. He saw the devil come in and tempt Adam and Eve and watch Adam and Eve cave. He watched them rebel against God's grace. And so now, as, a, as a, someone who has come and been born in the little town of Bethlehem, taking on humanity, he could have easily said, you know, been there, done that. I don't need to see that again. I don't need to see Satan come at me with temptations. I've been there. I watched it happen before. And yet, as Pastor Dinger pointed out, the Spirit led him straight from his baptism right into the wilderness for the express purpose of being tempted by Satan. And so he went straight into it. And so as I contemplated this, I wonder why? Why would Jesus need to, to face off with the devil, so to speak? Why would he need to endure these temptations, the same kind of temptations that Adam and Eve fell under the pressure of? What, why would he have to do that? What possibly good could it come from? Even as Pastor Dinger mentioned, you know, it was the same kind of scenario. The devil comes at him with the same thing. Here, have something to eat. Ironically, right, there Adam and Eve in the garden, they could eat from everything. That's what God says. Eat from all the trees in the garden. I sometimes wonder if we forget that part. You know, I'll sometimes ask people, so what's the first command God gave? And they'll tell me, well, to not eat from the tree. And actually, the first command He gave was to eat from all the trees. Eat from all the trees in the garden except the one. And so, you know, there's Adam and Eve. That's what they have going for them. But Jesus is in a wilderness for 40 days without eating. And yeah, even then stones start to look pretty good. And so it's still, Satan comes at him. You know, just have something to eat. Look at what you can have. I think what, what the devil is really trying to say is look at what I'm giving you. You know, God held out on you. He said, don't eat from that tree. But I'm saying, go ahead. God's saying to you, Jesus, here in the temptation, He brought you out here to starve. I'm saying, look at, just worship me and I'll give you everything you wanted. Just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth and all the power and the authority. Just go ahead. Look at what you can have. And then I think finally then, He's saying, you can be great. 
You can, you can have it all. God's holding out on you. You can't trust Him, I think is the lie that where, where the devil is really heading with all of this. Sure, he loves to, to spread angst and malcontent and destruction and deception, but ultimately what he really wants to do is get us to doubt God. He got Adam and Eve to doubt God and God's goodness and grace and love. And so he comes at Jesus and says, go ahead, throw yourself off. See if God really keeps you from hitting your foot on a stone. See if God really sent His angels to scoop you up. See if He'll do it. And so the devil is always after your faith. He's always wanting to distract you from God's love and grace. And it's the same as I mentioned. We face the same kind of temptations. The devil says to you, you know you want it. It looks good, doesn't it? You know it. You've thought about it. You've toyed with it. And then he says, you can have it. Just do this. You can have it. Just reach out. Take it. You can have it. Just go ahead and rebel against God's goodness. And ultimately, like I said, the devil is wanting to really emphasize this thing that does God really love you? When, when the devil asked Eve, is that what God really said? I think what he's saying to everyone is, does God really love you? Do you really believe that? If he can get us to doubt those things, then he's won. But in every scenario, Jesus says, I choose what God has sent me to do. And I do it for love. And you're not going to the devil is not going to change his mind on any one of these things. And so as I ask this question, why must Jesus face these same kind of temptations? I'm convinced it's because Jesus faced the devil and endured these temptations so He could be your Savior. That's why He did it. So He could be your Savior. And I think as we look at these temptations that Jesus endured here in the wilderness, we're going to find three other very great gifts that God gives to you this morning. And so let's look at them together. When we ask why does Jesus have to do this, the first one is for the removal of obstacles. For the removal of obstacles. Everything the devil is doing is to put obstacles in your way. Obstacles between. Barriers between you and Jesus. And so we see here that Jesus is going to remove these obstacles. It reminded me of a story I heard a couple of years ago, and it has to do with a Major League Baseball player by the name of Ben Zobrist. And, uh, and every winter season, when they're not practicing and things of that nature, they have these winter conventions. And, and so several of the players from the teams will gather at these conventions. It's an opportunity to have meetings and stuff like that. But, but for fans, it's an opportunity to go and meet some of your favorite ball players. And so one of these days, they set up in this, you know, conference center, and, and every ball player who's there, you know, they kind of get a booth. It's a little on a platform of the table, and they're in chairs behind the table. There's, right, there's barriers between the ball players and all these crazy fans. And, and, uh, and then they have security guards there, of course, so things don't get out of control. And this note came. It was from the, the security guard who had been assigned to working with Ben Zobrist at this convention. And, and the supervisors are given all the guards the same instruction. It was no pictures with the ball players, and sign one thing per person. You know, so sometimes, I mean, they'll show up with a baseball cap and a glove and a ball and a bat, and they want them to sign all of it. And so the instructions were very clear. We've got all these barriers, all these obstacles. The ball players stay on their side of the table. The fans stay on their side of the table. They sign one thing, no pictures. Well, when... Ben gets to his spot and the guard comes over. Ben says, listen, if somebody wants a picture with me, we're going to take a picture. And if somebody wants me to sign more than one thing, I'll sign everything they've got. And so the guard, of course, goes with what the baseball player says instead of what the supervisor says. So they're going through the day, right? And this is what the guard says. He says, I've never seen so many acts of genuine kindness before. And he just talks about it, and he gives a few examples of how Ben continually made it so people could approach him, and so that he, did, he removed these barriers and obstacles. For example, one, one elderly lady came forward, she's carrying a bat, but it's shaking in her hands because she's got Parkinson's disease. And so she comes up to Ben and says, I'd like to have you sign this for my grandson. And 
And what the guard says is he des- what he describes is that Ben got up from behind his table and left and stepped on a platform and, and he takes a hold of her hands in his and spends time praying with her. And then he talks with her and they take pictures together and he signs everything she wants him to sign. And then a moment, you know, a little bit later, another mom shows up with a couple of little boys, you know, and they've got their jerseys on and they're all into baseball. And, but the one, the youngest one, was a little nervous, you know, and just kind of hiding behind mom. So once again, Ben gets up from behind his table, comes out, gets off the platform and picks up the boy, the little boy, and carries him back up with him and sits down in his chair behind the table and is talking with the family and they're taking pictures. And, and the whole time he's signing things, he's letting the little boy play with his World Series ring. Sometimes you wish you were a little boy. (laughs) And so what Ben did over, I mean, he's he's got two MVP, I mean, he's got two World Series rings. He's an MVP in the 2016 World Series. He's a baseball player for years. And what he does over and over again is, I need to break down the barriers. I need to make sure people can approach me. I want them to know I'm real. I'm just a real guy. Well, Jesus goes so much further than that to break down barriers and to remove obstacles. He's the Son of God. It's just been stated in his baptism, right? The sky opens up. The Spirit descends like a dove. A voice from heaven says, This is my Son whom I'm well pleased. And then he goes out in the wilderness and we read this. And he ate nothing for those 40 days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. He's real. He's a real guy. And this is real temptation. And he's come here so that he can be our Savior. He is approachable. He's saying, I am real, and I'm going to remove every obstacle that could ever get in the way of your faith. And think about it. I mean, we just saw it, and Pastor Dinger mentioned it in the baptism here this morning. The disciples were trying to keep the kids away, and Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, let them all come. Not going to have barriers and obstacles here. And his whole ministry is full of him removing the barriers, tearing down the obstacles whether it be hanging out with fishermen and calling them as disciples and friends, tax collectors, maybe it's going and touching lepers and healing them, or spending time at a well with a Samaritan woman over a cup of water. Maybe it's having parties with outcasts. Jesus repeatedly was breaking down the barriers, encouraging faith in Him and removing any obstacle that could be in the way. So you have in this wilderness experience, the temptation, Jesus says, I am approachable by all. Everybody can approach Jesus Christ. So why must He face this temptation? Because He's approachable and He wants to remove any obstacle, any barrier from your faith being in Him. This brings us to the second point. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. So, the enhancement of empathy is our second point. The enhancement of empathy. You know, consider this. When, this short question, this phrase, when will it be over? When will it be over? I don't know, it sounds in my head pretty miserable. I don't know what it sounds like out there. I've had the flu all week. And, uh, and so my voice and everything, it just sounds like I'm in an echo chamber. And, and Pastor Dinger has been sick just as longer, really. And, uh, and so by day three, this Wednesday, I was saying, when will this be over? It's been three days already, you know? I've lost three days of my life to the couch. And, and so I was just thinking, when will this be over? And then I started thinking, but there are so many of us who suffer chronic conditions, when will those be over? And then I start thinking about folks who have been struggling with addictions for years, and maybe they're asking, when will it be over? Or people who are suffering from loss and grief, maybe they're asking, when will this be over? Maybe engaged in in relational strife or challenging circumstances. When will this be over? You know, this temptation lasts, you know, the 40 days and then the devil leaves, waits for another opportune moment to try and come at Jesus again. But the 40 days came to an end. 
But it was much longer than that, really, when you consider it. Jesus, from the time of His birth in Bethlehem to His crucifixion on the cross, 33 years approximately. When will it be over? 33 years. He left heaven. He left heaven and came to this broken world to save us. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and become a ransom for many. He who knew no sin became sin. And so it was, maybe when will this be over? And so it wasn't just 40 days or 33 years, but then there were the three years of His ministry or the that final week entering Jerusalem, right? Hosannas and palm branches to the end of the week crucify Him and hang Him on a cross. Which means the one day, really. The one day. When will this be over? Will it will be over when the atonement sacrifice has been made and when He who knew no sin became sin that we might be saved. When will it be over? And for all this time, for all this time, He was loving every minute of it. Let me clarify what I mean by that phrase, right? Every moment, He was engaged in loving. Every moment, He was loving. He's loving all those who He was with, and He was loving all those who would believe in Him. He was loving all of humankind from Adam and Eve till the end of time. He was loving every moment of His life on this earth was spent loving. Loving others. And so, when will this be over? Never. Because His love for us is unconditional and eternal. And so, He will always love. And what happens in this enhancement of empathy and this expression of love is I can say, Jesus gets me. Jesus understands me. He went 40 days facing the temptations of, of the evil one. I sometimes don't last four minutes. Just being honest. And, and so, Jesus, when will this be over? He tells us that He gets us. And His empathy for us expresses His love to us. Hebrews 4 tells us that He is able to empathize with us. He is able to do so. So this enhancement of empathy is for you to have great confidence that Jesus gets you. In the times of struggle, whether it be wondering how long a grief or a struggle or how long we'll we'll deal with a sin, He says, I get you. You can can be sure that Jesus understands. So why did He have to go through those temptations? He was expressing His love and His understanding to us who struggle. This brings me to our last point. The efficacy of His sacrifice really gives us reason to hope. His sacrifice, for lack of a better way to say it, worked because He did face the temptations and He was victorious and He overcame. You know, Superman has morphed over the years. When I was a kid, it was the old TV shows and every show started out with, you know, he's faster than a speeding bullet. He's stronger than a locomotive. He can leap tall buildings in a single bound. And look, there's a bird, a plane. No, it's Superman, right? And so there would be this sometime during the show, there would be this scene where somebody was in distress and Clark Kent would duck into a phone booth and he'd emerge with a pajamas on that says a big S on the front and he would go save the day, you know. And that was was Superman. But like I said, he's kind of morphed over the years. He's changed over time and taken on a little bit different persona. And so in the 2013 movie, Man of Steel, where Superman kind of almost turns himself into the government agency and he's in this secure lockdown place and he wants to talk with Lois Lane and so they're having this conversation. And and so she's asking him some questions and, and she says to him, so, you know, what does the S stand for? And he says, oh, it's not an S. On my planet, it stands for... Hope. That's his answer. And as he goes on and talks with Lois Lane, he's basically saying, and, and so I've come, you know, I'm here on your planet and I'm going to offer hope. But we know that Superman has his weaknesses. We know that he helps maybe a few at a time. But he cannot save everyone and he can't offer hope without end. 
But Jesus, Jesus does offer hope for everyone without end. And so you heard that at the end. His answer to Satan, when Satan says, go ahead, throw yourself down, see if God will send angels to catch you. Jesus says, do not put the Lord your God to the test, which means he, you know, basically, this is God's will. It is God's will for me to save all of humankind. It is God's will for me to do for all people what they cannot do for themselves. Through Christ's work, through life, and then on his, in His death on the, on the cross, and His resurrection from the grave, He has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. He gives you forgiveness. He restores you in your relationship with God Almighty. And He gives you an eternal hope. Eternal life with Jesus Christ who loves you. So why did He do this? He did this for all of humankind. It was one time for all people. He saved us from our sins. He saved us from our own rebellion that we might be restored to Him. The reason Jesus faced the devil and endured these temptations are for these three reasons. For faith. Your faith in Him. For hope. Hope that does not disappoint. And for love. And the greatest of these is love. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your expression of love to us in this moment and even in the wilderness as Jesus endured not only those temptations, but he endured the cross and all of its shame that we might know you and know salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.